Please be seated. This morning we return to 1 Peter, Peter's letter, his epistle to Christians who had been dispersed, who had been moved from their home and their location and sprinkled and scattered away from home. They've received this letter from Peter probably in the 60s in Turkey in Asia Minor. And his letter so far, so we spent six weeks in chapter 1 and this morning we'll begin chapter 2. His letter so far has sought to encourage them with a realistic view of what life will be like as a follower of Jesus in this world. He has prepared them to suffer for their faith in Jesus. He's been very honest and sobering about that reality. But he's also sought to root them and their hope in the promises that God has made for all eternity. That they would be a people not thinking just of the here and now, but that they would be thinking of the world yet to come. And that their great sense of hope and their mindset through suffering is not in the here and now, but in the promises of God for eternity. Now this morning as we begin what for us is chapter 2 of his letter, we're going to experience a word of exhortation. A word of exhortation. So what is exhortation? Exhortation is an instructive word that seeks to encourage a particular kind of behavior. Some instruction with authority to encourage behavior in a certain direction. So listen to these first three verses, only three verses from chapter 2 of 1 Peter, and listen to the exhortation. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good." Let's pray that the Lord would exhort us. Lord, would you be our teacher this morning? Would you take these words written long ago and would you work them into our lives, into our minds, into our hearts that we might understand who we are called to be as your people in your world. And we ask it and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So in 2014, through a friend, actually through the wife of a friend, I became aware of a book that perhaps some of you have heard of. Maybe you've made use of it. A little book called Eat This, Not That. Have you heard of that book? Eat This, Not That. And it now has kind of blossomed into more than a book. It's blossomed into... A marketing campaign, of all things, to make money. Um, Go figure. But essentially it's this. The idea, the concept is someone who um, asserts that they are an authority in nutrition and health says, okay, if you're going to live in this world and you're going to choose off of the menus or out of the grocery stores and the food that's available to you, if you want to be healthy, eat this not that. And so it's, it's actually pretty interesting. It's, it's the idea of trying to help people make better decisions, right? Um, eat, and, and it gets very specific. So the concrete example would be, if you're going down the aisle of the grocery store and you have eight different spaghetti sauces that you could choose from, this person does the hard work of picking the one that has the least sugar, the least additives, the, the whatever. So they would say, eat this brand and this particular kind, not that. Or maybe some of you who are, who are parents, another illustration maybe would be 
when, when you're correcting the behavior of a child and you want to do away with one behavior while encouraging another behavior, uh, you might say something like, well, how about a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that? Or maybe some of you husbands have been talked to like that. <laughs> a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that would be a, a good thing for you to live and to practice and to experience. That in and of itself is a word of exhortation. This will serve you better than that. And that essentially is Peter's exhortation to these Christians. He's going to say in his own way, you need more of this and less of that. You need more of the pure spiritual milk that God has for your nourishment and less of what you're naturally doing and how you're behaving. More of this and less of that. That's how I'm going to summarize uh, the beginning of his exhortation in chapter 2 in verse 1. But we're going to take this in a few pieces and try to, to squeeze out of this what we really should hear and apply. And I hope this is helpful. If perhaps you're reading through Peter's letter as we uh, work through this. My hope is that this help, might help model how do we read the Scriptures line by line, word by word, and try to understand and apply what the Scriptures are, are teaching us, how they're exhorting us in this case. So we'll begin with verse uh, 1 of chapter 2. The first word there, therefore. And you've heard it said before that when the Scripture says, therefore, the first question you should ask is what? What's the therefore, therefore? Right? What does it mean? What does he mean, therefore? Therefore what? Quite simply, he means everything I just said in chapter 1. In light of all that, now here comes your exhortation. In light of what he has said in verse 3 of chapter 1, in light of your new birth, that you have been born again, you're a new people, in light of the fact that you're new people, and in verses 22 and, tw verses 22 and 23, he says, because that spirit, that new life, has brought sincere brotherly love. Okay? So if you've experienced the new birth, you're to be characterized by sincere brotherly love for the people of God. Therefore, if that's true, and here comes the exhortation, Having a new identity. That's how I'm going to capture his first concept. Having a new identity. And the identity, he says, these people are to have because of that new birth and their sincere love for each other is that they have purged, they have put off, they have put away carnal, worldly behavior that plagues every community of people. Okay? He's speaking of having a new identity, being a people who have put off old behavior, old ways, and that is our new identity. These people, he essentially says, these people are known, or they are to be known, as the ones who have put off old ways. They're the ones who have put off behavior. And this is where he goes into a litany of the behavior that should not be true of these people or of us. And I'll just list them for now. Here he says, Having rid yourselves of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Now, I'm going to come back and speak to each of those in just a moment. But I want you to get the big picture of what he's saying. Since you're a people of the new birth, since you're a people who therefore have a sincere brotherly love, therefore you can't be, you've you got to be a people who have put off malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Dan Doriani says about this list of sins... He says the sins that Peter names are not gross vices of paganism, but they are community 
destroying vices. I want you to think about that. How each of those words, each of those descriptors, destroys community. They are the same vices that are often practiced and tolerated within the church, Doriani says. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, or insincerity. So I think that's right. This is a summary of what should not be true of the church or of any one of us. And Peter speaks to these people as you're supposed to have put these things off. These are the things that should not be true of any one of you. Having rid yourselves to participle, being the people who have put these things away, they are off of you. And here's the descriptor of what each of these is. Malice. This is all from from Dan Doriani. Malice is best understood as the evil or wickedness in the broadest possible sense. It is ill will towards others. And maybe that's the easiest way to remember it. If you're a person of malice, you've got ill will. You've got bad intentions towards people. You want to do harm. You want to get back. You want to get even. And Peter says, not not to be true, the people of God. Not supposed to be true. And then he says, we get rid of deceit. Deceit is a wide-ranging vice that includes all dishonesty, whether it's in words or in deeds. And he says, the people of God are not, they're supposed to have put off deceit. They're not deceitful people. They're honest people. And then he says, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is an insincerity and an inconsistency of belief and practice in one's inner and outer life. It's two-facedness, we could say. It's having one face with one people and another face with another group of people. Peter says that's not supposed to be true with the people of God. They're supposed to be consistent. The same kind of people wherever they are, whoever they're spending time with. And then he lists envy. Envy is the gnawing sorrow that we feel when someone else has something that we think we deserve. And as it says in the Proverbs, envy can rot the bones. It can eat you alive from the inside out. Peter says, not the people of God. They're not envious of the gifts or calling that God gives someone else. They're thankful for who they are and what they have and trust that that was God's will for them. And then lastly, he says slander, which we understand to be untruthful information usually said behind someone's back to distort the perception of that person. And again, Peter says, not the people of God. Mm -mm -mm. Not to be a slanderous people. We don't speak about people behind their backs to destroy them. Rather, we wish to edify them and to build them up. Karen Jobes, who's a commentator uh, on Peter that's very scholastic and academic. She sums this up this way. She says, This exhortation is for the moral transformation that is demanded by the call to put off, which is a verb that was a reference to the removal of clothing. Numerous usages of the same verb in the New Testament show that this word was used idiomatically to refer to the shedding of behavior that was inconsistent with the Christian life. So here, that language, the imagery that Peter is using here is the shedding off, the discarding, the ridding, the removal like you would clothes. Now, your home is probably not like mine, but but kids can come in from sports practice or from school and they've got a backpack on and either it has books in it or it has soccer gear on it, and they come in the door, and what do they do? Shimmy it off, right? Just let it drop on the floor or throw it on a bench. I did the exact same thing. Or um, someone goes to take a shower, and there can just be this 
you know, this trail of clothes that leads its way to the shower. That's a discarding, a taking off, a putting off, a removal. And the imagery is exactly what Peter uses about these sins. That we're to be putting these off. We're to shed these things from our lives. It's not to be on us. It's not to be what we're about. We're supposed to be different. These are the things that every one of us is supposed to purge and get rid of. So we just enjoyed spring break, Easter break in our family. And I'm very, very proud to tell you that I addressed, I began to address a list of to-do projects for the spring. And one of those was 22 years in the making. So behind our house, we have this, it used to be a red barn, now it's a gray barn. That was another project that I did last year. Anyway, uh, that gray barn has 22 years of memories and stuff in it. Furniture, our furniture, furniture people gave us, old toys, toy boxes, tennis rackets, you name it, it's been in that barn accumulating for 22 years. A lot of memories. And my personality type has always been the the sort of, um, don't throw it away, if there's any possible scenario in which in your mind you could conceive using that somehow, some way down the road, right? Everybody thinks that way, right? So I'm actually married to a purger. She will shed and, and get rid of stuff um, a little quicker than I will, okay? We'll just say that. So this was a big week for me, y'all. I finally threw stuff away. Stuff that I've had for 20 years that I told myself I would fix, I would fix. Um, And for whatever reason, maybe it's I've reached the point in my life that I'm maturing. (laughs) I finally said, I'm not going to fix that. It's been too long. And so what did I do? I purged it. I loaded it up on a trailer, actually two, two trailer loads, and I finally purged it. I finally got rid of it. And we took it to the dump. Actually, my boys took it to the dump for me. And they they got rid of it. That's the imagery of purging, of ridding yourself of things you want to hold on to. Right? And you think, well, that list of things, who wants to hold on to those things? Well, here's something to think about. Why is Peter writing these Christians in the 60s who are sprinkled about far from home Does he have inside information that maybe they were struggling with slander, with deceit, with hypocrisy, with envy, with malice? We don't know that he has any inside specific information. Is it more of this? You can speak to human beings anywhere at any time in the history of the world and find that they are struggling with malice and deceit and hypocrisy, and envy, and slander, because those are the universal common sins of the human heart. I think that's what it is, right? Um, That book from years ago, Everything I Ever Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten, right? Speaks to the general principles and truths that every human being knows to be true. Well, what we know of the human heart is it's filled because of sin with malice and hypocrisy and deceit and slander. And that's who we are. And so Peter hits the bullseye even by speaking generally and broadly. And these are the sins, these are the characteristics that we tend to want to hold on to, right? This is true to who we are. And Peter says, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you are reborn You've experienced a new birth. You're becoming a new person, having shed, having rid yourselves of malice and envy and deceit and hypocrisy and slander. You're to be the people who don't hold on to those sins, but who let them go, who shed it like a backpack walking in the door, 
who leave those sins like a trail of clothes on the, on the way to the, to the shower. That's supposed to be our relationship with sin. We're not to be defined by it anymore. We don't identify with it anymore. We're to have shed and removed such behavior. So says Peter. Now, in its place, so less of that, Peter would say, but more of what? More of the milk, the pure spiritual milk that will grow you up in your salvation. He says in verse 2, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Like newborn babies. Now listen, you've experienced this. This is his illustration, not mine. But newborn babies are hungry. And they are mad about it. And they will get your attention that they need food by what? Screaming and crying and demanding. They will, they will get you to provide what they must have, which is their nourishment. Their milk. And Paul refers certainly to the Word of God, but probably, excuse me, Peter, I think I said Paul. Peter refers to certainly what is the Word of God, but probably other graces available to them to nourish them in their faith. That they are to have a new appetite, not for the things of this world, but for pure spiritual milk. So I saw a video um, this week <clears throat> related to this idea. At least it was in my mind. Um, and it's amazing the things that are available to you on YouTube, by the way. But this was an educational video from decades ago. And it was listed as how to discover or how to get a, a baboon. I know this sounds crazy. Give me a second. How to get a baboon in the desert to reveal to you his water source. Now, this is very important information you may want to tuck away should you ever be trapped in a desert. This is how you could find water, okay? And this was an instructional educational video that they showed in, in schools. I'm not making this up. You can go watch it today. But here's the fascinating truth of it. So the tribesmen would go to um, an object. This was a big anthill dig a little hole in it, and put some watermelon seeds, knowing that a baboon was watching, a curious baboon. And uh, put some watermelon seeds in, in the perfectly sized hole, and then the tribesmen would just walk away from it and then go hide and watch. And what would happen is the baboon would come, stick his hand in the hole, grab the watermelon seeds and make a fist, and not be able to get loose, right? This is another illustration I've used on other things. But that's not the illustration today. So he won't let go of the seeds, and he's stuck. Well, then comes back the tribesman. Puts a noose around the baboo's, babo, bamboo, baboon, the baboon's head, and ties him to a tree. Now begins the illustration. The baboon that is tied to the tree, the tribesman then takes out of his patch these crystals of salt, large clumps of salt, which are not very available in that region. And he'll put him right within the reach of the baboon who loves the salt and the minerals and will devour the salt and the minerals. Now what happens? Thirst. And he lets the baboon sit in his thirst for a while. And then he comes, he unties the baboon. And apparently baboons are very secretive about their water supply, something I did not know this week. And then all he's got to do is follow the baboon to the water. And, and they show this on video. He goes, somehow it's an underground cave in the desert. Don't ask too many questions about the illustration. But it's all there and you can watch it. But here's the point. The point of the illustration, and there is one, is that craving and longing and desperate, God, I have this thirst quenched. And the baboon captures it. It takes a little salt to reveal the thirstiness. 
But there's a desire there to quench that thirst, get out of my way. I am going to get what I need. That's a craving. That's a powerful craving. And that's the imagery that Peter uses to say these Christians should be craving the pure spiritual milk that God will feed them to help them grow up in their salvation. And he says they're like newborn babies. Some of you have memories like my family does of of traveling in a car with a, a newborn baby in a car seat. And you're on a long trip and you're just waiting for the baby to awaken for feeding time, right? And when that baby awakens, the car is pulling over, period. (laughs) Baby's going to get what baby needs and wants because no one can withstand the crying demands, the hunger, the thirst of the child. Peter says that's how Christians should be. They should hunger, they should thirst, they should crave, they should long for, they should have pangs for the pure spiritual milk. The Word, the graces of God that will grow Christians. Now, there's an obvious application to make there, which is, so what's your posture towards milk? Spiritual milk. Are you hungry? Or are you kind of apathetic? Take it or leave it, right? One of the men I listened to on this passage this week said, you know, if we could just create our appetite. But the truth is, for every one of us, our appetites for the milk of God and His Word, they can wax and they can wane. Can't just make an appetite. But you know you've got to feed or you won't be nourished And you won't grow up. So doing a little self-evaluation. How's your appetite for God's Word? Is it apathetic? Is it shoulder shrugging your response to God's Word? Or are you hungry for it? Or if you're not hungry, can you at least make yourself show up? To be within the reach of God's Word. To hear it, to read it on your own, to do whatever you need to do. Peter says this has everything to do with your spiritual maturity. Your degree of exposure to the Word of God, to the graces of God, it will have direct impact on how much you grow or you don't grow. You may know that our men uh, meet routinely for fellowship and playfully we've called it feed your faith because we'll try to have some good food. Right? Last time it was shrimp and grits. I still think about that shrimp and grits about once a week. I don't know if Dr. Hegler's here. Boy, those were good shrimp and grits. But we did more than shrimp and grits. We had an elder share his testimony of how God had worked in his life and grown him and overcome issues and obstacles. And so it is true. You know, food can make fellowship all the more enjoyable. I believe in it even if it's just Little Caesar's Pizza, youth. Um, Have some good food, but we want to feed your faith, right? We want substance to come to bear because you will either grow or not grow based on how you're spending the season of your life. And that's true of all the ministries of our church. We want to feed people the substance of the Word. We want to sing truth when we sing hymns and songs of praise. We want to grow. We want to grow on the pure spiritual milk that God provides for His children. So are you apathetic or do you have a sense of urgency that I need to be there, my family needs to be there, my spouse needs to be there, or we will not grow up. We will be malnourished. We will not grow into the people that God's calling us to be. The Lord says He gives us what we need to grow up in our salvation. And that's verse 2. There is quite clearly from Peter an expectation of maturity. An expectation of growth. And he says that there is a nourishment that is required for that maturity. And there's your sense of urgency. That's why we show up. Even on the days that, that maybe we're not hungry. Maybe we're not thirsty. But we know we need the nourishment. 
We've got to show up in order to grow up. We won't grow up in our salvation if we are malnourished, if we are undernourished in God's Word. And then lastly, this is the fifth piece of these three verses. And this is very important. And it is the word if. It's the word if. Now, the version that I read intentionally this morning is from the NIV. I want you to know that um, I use the NIV 90% of the time when I teach publicly. And there's a reason for that. It's because I grew up with the NIV version of the Bible. It's what comes to my mind. It's what I've memorized. Um, But there are times where particular translations are less helpful than others with particular passages of Scripture. So what I want to do is I'm going to read for you. I don't think I have it on a slide. I'm going to read for you again in the, in the NIV, the end of verse 3. And then I'm going to read it in the ESV, which is a more literal translation. I want you to listen for the difference. Verse 3 in the NIV. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, this is the ESV version of it, the more literal translation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, one of those might sound or read better to you um, in the English, but I want, to, I want to end the sermon with this important emphasis. Peter is laying a condition before these people. And that is that they may or may not have experienced and tasted for themselves that the Lord is good. He doesn't know. But if they have tasted the goodness of the Lord, then there will be a response to shed off these sins, to put off, to rid themselves of these sins. If they have tasted the goodness of the Lord, then they will crave pure spiritual milk. And so as they receive this letter and hear these words, even as as you hear them now, it is the press of the same covenant and the same covenant conditionality that God's people have always had, Old Testament and New Testament. And that is that we must persist in our faith There is this conditionality. And if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is, in fact, good, then you will respond accordingly. But what if you've not tasted? What if you feel like you've been a spectator all of your life to the goodness of the Lord? Maybe you feel like you've just been dragged to church, put in ministry, expected to be there, but but you've just never personally tasted and experienced the goodness of the Lord. I was reminded this week of a movie. Um, You know, Pastor Paul enjoys movies. But uh, if you like a Western movie, in 2003, there was a movie called Open Range. And Open Range uh, stars Robert Duvall and Kevin Costner. It's directed by Kevin Costner. And I want to close with this because I I just think it is rich. I think it is helpful. So bear with me for just a moment. The purpose of the movie is the telling of two cowboys who are free grazing their cattle across the Wild West in 1882. The herd of cattle that they are grazing makes its way to a small frontier town that is led by a kingpin rancher and a corrupt sheriff who together rule the town with fear, with tyranny, and with violence. And this all results, by the way, in what you would expect in a good cowboy movie. And that is a showdown and a shootout at the end of the movie. The showdown and shootout between good and evil. So you've got your two main characters, and they are preparing to die. And they want to prepare to die and address some, some last hopes and some last pleasures. So the two cowboys make their way to the general store in the town. And they go in 
And Robert Duvall, who plays the part of boss, is the main character in this scene. So bear with me with this dialogue, which, which I think is, is beautiful and relates to Peter. So the one cowboy says to the other, The whole town knows there's a fight coming. And boss, Robert Duvall says, Well, if I'm going to get killed, i got a hankering to soothe my sweet tooth. I'm thinking about some candy. And this is as they make their way into the general store where they speak to Ralph the clerk. And he asks Ralph, clerk, Ralph the clerk for some candy. And the clerk responds and says, well, we've got anything you want. Jawbreakers, gumdrops, candy canes, licorice, caramels, lollipops. And boss says, nah, I'm looking for something special. What's the most expensive thing you've got? And the clerk says, I've got just the thing. And he pulls out and says, this is dark chocolate. It comes all the way from Switzerland. They call it bittersweet. They say it melts in your mouth. And boss says, well, have you tried it? And the clerk sheepishly says, no. And boss says, well, how do you know it melts in your mouth? And the clerk turns and sheepishly looks at his wife. And he says, well, the truth is, we can't afford it ourselves. And boss says, looking at him, mm-hmm. Well, I'll take two of them. And three of your finest cigars... My friend and me got a hankering for Switzerland chocolate and a good smoke. And boss then starts to open up the dark Swiss chocolate, takes a bite of a square and says, this is good. It's worth every penny. And then he looks at Ralph the clerk. He breaks off a piece of chocolate and says, here, try it, Ralph. Go on, try it. The clerk takes the chocolate and eats it. And then here it is. Boss Spearman says, It's been sitting right here in front of you all these years. And you've never even tried it. Such a shame to go forever without taking a taste of something so good. That's it. Then they go and they get shot up and they get killed. But the first time I saw that scene, and I've seen it many times, and I do hope some of you will watch that. You're like, oh my goodness. That's the gospel in the South. Where everybody's grown up around the dark Swiss chocolate. But people have not really taken a taste of it. It's just around them. It's just there. What a shame to grow up around all the chocolate. And never take a taste for yourself. You see it? You see the imagery? It is amazing. Peter says, If indeed you've tasted, that you've seen that the Lord is good. And, and he's, that's, a, that's a pastoral tweak there. He's letting them know. It may be that some of you have not. It may be that you have not shed off and put off malice and deceit and hypocrisy and slander and envy. Maybe you're still carrying those sins around like a backpack. Maybe you're not craving the pure spiritual milk that God would use to grow you up. Maybe you're just apathetic, shoulder shrugging towards it. Don't want to go. Don't want to hear God's word. I'll just stay at home. That's why Peter gives that conditional if that unfortunately may not be in your version of the Bible. But it is there and it is so consistent with the whole of Scripture. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This morning, if you're hearing this, a lot of rambling words, but I hope the central, central message of it is clear to you. Peter says there should be more of this and less of that. And the only way that can be true for you is if your faith is in Jesus. It's the only way it can be true for you. And if you're confused about what that means and what that looks like, 
Well, there's a lot of people at GPC that would love to talk to you from our experience of what that means. What it means to have more of this and less of that by having faith in Jesus. Amen? Let's pray that God would work that message into our lives. Lord, we want to taste and see and know your goodness. We don't want to spend these years together having not tasted and seen. It would be a shame. So Lord, I pray for us individually. I pray for our families. If we've been spectators to faith, spectators to worship, Lord, would you make us to be participants? Those who see and taste and know the truth of the gospel. So Lord, would you work that in us? Would you stir up in us? And maybe even cause us to have the courage to speak and to ask that we might have more of this and less of that. We ask it and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.